Hallelujah, oh hallelujah, oh hallelujah. 
Let me see you leave for joy. So grab your hands, stomp your feet, wave your hands, leave for joy. Oh, clap your hands, stomp your feet, wave your hands, leave for joy. And if you're not ashamed to praise the Lord, let me see you clap your hands. If you're not ashamed to praise the Lord, let me see you stomp your feet. Not ashamed to praise the Lord. Let me see you wave your hands. If you're not ashamed to praise the Lord, let me see you leave for joy. Go clap your hands, stomp your feet, wave your hands, leave for joy. For joy, leave 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 for joy, then open your mouth and shout yes, Lord, open your mouth and shout yes, Lord, open your mouth and shout yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, open your mouth and shout yes, Lord. Open your mouth and shout yes, Lord. Open your mouth and shout yes, Lord. 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 That we win. Oh, no matter what the weapon is, I want you to know that we win. Oh, and no matter what the weapon is, I want you to know that we win. No matter what the weapon is, I want you to know that I win. Oh, I win. Yes, 
Yes, Lord. 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 Pentecost, this is that.
Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Great is our Lord and of great power. Hallelujah. Psalms 149, praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises on him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth to execute. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. His excellent greatness. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet, with the sultry and harp, temporal and dance. Oh, let everything that has been praise He, the Lord. Hallelujah. One more time, can we give a great shout of praise unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today? Hallelujah. The Lord taketh pleasure in his people. And he is here right now. In the name of Jesus. Let's keep praying right there in the Holy Ghost. We want to bring some knees before the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus is in the house right now. And we want to pray for Jessica that cancer will be eradicated in the name of Jesus. Let's continue to pray for Doug Weber and Daniel Sarah. To pray for Sister Georgia Bartlett in the name of Jesus. Also at this time we want to continue to pray for Brother Bob Medlin. Man in Tucson goes to Pastor Connor's church. He's battling covid had to put him on the ventilator. We need a miracle from the Lord in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I come to you right now knowing that you're able to do all things, Jesus. In this very presence that we're feeling in this place, I pray let it go forth to every life that has been spoken today. To every need in the name of Jesus. Let them feel your presence, almighty God. Let it come in in a gentle, sweet way. Let your hand of healing rest upon them in Jesus' name. Let every sickness be gone. God, let cancer be gone. Let COVID be gone in the name of Jesus. God, bring complete healing by the powerful name of Jesus, God, we bind together with faith, believing, knowing that you're able to do all things. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we worship you, God. Oh, let's clap our hands unto the Lord this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. You may return to your seats this morning. My sister Martin, you come at this time. So thankful for the presence of the Lord that is in this place this morning. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. How many is glad to be in the house of the Lord today? 
How many is thankful that Jesus showed up today? Hallelujah. Can we clap our hands unto the Lord? Again, we love you, Jesus. We worship. Praise the Lord, church. Um, I'd like to start off by honoring all the fathers that are here. Happy Father's Day. So if you are a father, if you would please stand up. All right, let's give them a round of applause. All right, you may all be seated. May all wonderful dads enjoy a happy Father's Day. So I would like to share a little poem. Um, it's titled, A Father Is. There in every memory, see his love and care, strength and hands to count on, freely he does share. Provider, toil so faithfully to make our dreams come true, give strong and tender discipline, though it is hard to do. A father is God's chosen one to lead the family and point it to his will for life of love and harmony. Today is a celebration honoring all you fathers, but we especially want to honor our pastor, Pastor Sansom. So, Pastor, if you want to come on up. <laughs> so, we, so, we just wanted to honor you with some gifts to show our appreciation. We love and honor you very much. Happy Father's Day. Well, thank you for the kind words and the array of gifts and cards and this little basket. I don't, I don't know exactly what all it is here. It's got a picture of a train on there that says, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I needed that encouragement today. It's been about a month since I've preached, so I think I can today. So thank you so much. It is such an honor and a privilege that God has placed us here to pastor you wonderful people Thankful for the faithful men and women of this church and what God is doing among us. I love you, and I will go through all of this later on this afternoon. Thank you so much. May God bless you. You may be seated today. Amen, amen. I want to tag along with Sister Martin. Once again, wish every father a happy Father's Day. And uh, this is my second one, and I love it. I love being a father. Hallelujah. You don't even know I might have less hair, but that's okay. I still love him to death. Let's remember no service tonight. Gather with your family, with all the fathers. Celebrate today. Have a wonderful time. Also, let's remember let's coming Wednesday, 7 p.m. prayer meeting. I am thankful for what God is doing in prayer meeting at 7 p.m. And then right into Bible study when the Holy Ghost just moves. Amen. Also, Friday, for all of our transformed youth, youth mini golf will be happening Friday, this coming Friday. At this time, can we come? Let's stand before the Lord. We're going to come and bring our tithes and offerings today. I am thankful for the blessings of Almighty God. He never fails. If you want to give electronically, you can see Sister Lindsay Galenzo to my left. At this time, let's get out. Let's bring our tithes before the Lord in Jesus' name.
Would you lift your hands and love him all over this house today? I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessings and glory. That has got to be one of my favorite, favorite worship songs because it can just roll on and on and on and on. You say, but pastor, everything isn't great in my life right now. Then that's the song you ought to be singing right here and now. Because when I look into the Old Testament, I find the tribe of Judah going into battle first. The enemy was greater than the children of God. The enemy was far greater than the children of Israel. Uh, but the word of God came to the man of God, uh, marching to battle the tribe of Judah. That was the singers and the praisers first. Uh, and the song they were to sing uh, mirrored this very closely. Uh, For the Lord is good, uh, and his mercy endureth forever. Uh, life may not be good right now, uh, but God is good, and his mercy endures forever. Uh, why don't you lift your hands uh, and go ahead and sing your way into battle right now. Uh, sing the praises of God in this house. Now why don't you do like the song said. Shout it out. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. You ought to shout with a war cry. a God moment right here. Go ahead and enjoy it. It's a Sila moment. Let the Holy Ghost minister to you right now. this house voices and hands raised and praise and worship to God and would you glorify the name of the Lord Why don't you reach over, pray for someone next to you. Let's let the body minister to one another right now. Uh, pray for one another right now in the name of Jesus. Uh, bear one another's burdens. Lift their needs before the Lord right now. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Pray blessings and strength upon them. Uh, pray the hand of God and the peace of God would rest upon them. Uh, this is a God moment right now. Transformed, you were just at camp. Stop praying in the Holy Ghost.
the passage I just referenced in the Old Testament where they went in singing for the Lord is good, his mercy endureth forever. They came out victorious. It's very elementary, but it bears pointing out. We always point out the praise part, but I want to point this out. When they went into battle, it was not one person going into battle. They went into battle together. And so I don't know where you're at at your lot in life right now, but I want you to know this. You're not going in alone. I feel an unction of the Holy Ghost in this house right now. You're not going in alone. You're going to have to open yourself up to your brothers and your sisters. Uh, you don't have to give them all the dirty laundry and all the details, but you're going to have to lean on them. And as you go in it together, sing them, for the Lord is good. And His mercy endureth forever. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to play out, but I know this, you will be victorious. Uh, I don't know how it's going to be answered, but I know this, you're going to come out victorious on the other side. Uh, I say as a church, let's go in singing together, uh, and let's come out singing together on the other side. Uh, oh, there's power when you go in together, because one can put a thousand to flight, uh, but you may be in a battle with more than a thousand right now, uh, but two shall put ten thousand to flight. Uh, it multiplies exponentially as we join together. Uh, we're going and singing together. Uh, we're going to come out singing together. Uh, this is the body of Christ. Uh, this is the church of the living God. Uh, and upon this rock I will build my church. Uh, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, hell has brought an onslaught against you uh, and against this church. Uh, but we're going in singing together. Uh, for the Lord is good uh, and His mercy endureth forever. Uh, and I'll shout it out. Uh, and when we come out on the other side, uh, we will will be singing, uh, I've got the victory. Uh, I've got the victory. Uh, no, we'll be singing, uh, we've got the victory uh, because we fight the battle together with the Lord. Would you give him praise today? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, would you lift your voice like the victory's already been won and give him a shout of praise in this house? Now would you lift your voice and shout like the victory's been won for your brother or your sister that you just prayed for. Your victory is in your shout. Oh, would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise today? I'll let you be seated this morning. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord on this Father's Day. Thank you for the wonderful array of gifts and kind words. I so appreciate that. I give honor to every father in this house. I thank God for you and the difference you're making in this church and in this world. Thank God for our fathers. Amen. I give special honor to my father. So thankful for him today, his voice of wisdom and guidance and direction, him going through making sure his family was always taken care of. I watched him on numerous occasions be bivocational and, and uh, juggling many different th responsibilities in the kingdom of God, but his family was never neglected, and I thank you for that, Dad, and I'm so glad you're with us on this Father's Day. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. That's all right. Give him, give him a hand clap of appreciation. Amen. And to our students, you represented PRC well. As far as I know, up through the last night, I didn't hear all the details. I just heard it got wild. But you can be proud of our students. They were just worshiping the Lord. There's, there's a depth in these students. There's a depth in these students. There was a lot of zeal. A lot of passion at camp, and I would much rather work with zeal and passion than students sitting on the back row with their hands crossed, smuggling the things into camp they're not supposed to bring. It was a camp full of zeal and passion, but our students went beyond zeal and passion, and there was a depth in them, and I thank God for that. Thank God for the Felties and the Connors that were there working with our students. The future is bright around here. 
Amen. All our guests, we welcome you. I'm going to let you remain seated while we go to the Word of the Lord today. It is a lengthy passage of Scripture for our text. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 8 through 23. Is anyone going to help pastor preach today? Amen. I'm going to need it. It's, I looked at the Scripture notes that I provide to our projection. The last date that I provided Scripture notes to our projection team, I believe, was May 22nd. So it's been almost a month. So I'm going to need your help. I don't know if I know how to do this anymore. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 8 through 23. Lengthy passage of Scripture. Just bear with me. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was a dino that is as night. He left up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ohoite, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. And his hand clave under the sword, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and there were people returned after him only to spoil. After him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory." And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam, and the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. And David was thin in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was thin in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate. And took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. And Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zerariah, was chief among the three. He lifted up his spear against three hundred and slew them. And had the name among the three. Was he not most honorable of three? Therefore he was their captain. Howbeit he attained not unto the first three. And Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzil, who had done many acts. Look at this. He slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in a time of snow. And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man, and the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with just a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and and had the name among three mighty men. He was more honorable than the thirty, but he attained not to the first three, and David set him over his guard. Then as you go through verses 24 through 39, it lists several other of David's mighty men without the details that define their greatness. And so I want to preach today, if you all will help me on this subject matter, the influence of the king. The influence of the king. Would you place your Bible down? Would you lift your hands? Would you pray and ask that God would help your pastor? And that God would help you today to receive his word. Father, I love you and I bless your name, Jesus. I thank you for the presence of God. I thank you for the presence of God and the people of God that have gathered in this house. I thank you, Lord, because we surrender to your purposes. And I know that they shall be fulfilled in the name of Jesus. I surrender my tongue and my mind to you that it may do your will today. Nothing more and nothing less in the name of Jesus. And God, we open our hearts and our spirits to you today. Would you talk to us and help us to receive your word? Shape us and mold us. And Father, I pray that your influence would be on every one of us. In the name of Jesus. Do a work in my life. Do a work in the life of every individual here. In Jesus' name, now would you give him praise in this house. Hallelujah.
In 2 Samuel 23, we are nearing the end of King David's life. The first several verses record some of the last words of King David. And then the chapter begins to list the name of David's mighty men. There are 37 in all listed in this chapter. This chapter also provides details for us, uh, for some of the men, of what defined them for their greatness, uh, their acts that they were caught up in. Uh, we read of a Dido who slew 800 men at one time uh, with a spear. We read of a man by the name of Eleazar who fought so hard and so fierce that when the battle was over, they went to take the sword from his hand. But it was so forced to it, they had to unpry his hand to take the sword from him. We read of a man by the name of Shammah who slew an entire troop of Philistines defending a simple bean field. Uh, we read of three unnamed men uh, that broke through the garrison of the Philistines uh, simply to get David his favorite drink of water from his favorite well in Bethlehem. Uh, we read of Abishai who slew 300 with just a spear in his hand. Uh, Benaiah, the one that stands out to me, uh, slew two lion-like men uh, and then fought a lion in a pit on a snowy day and won that. Imagine putting that on your resume. And then he was armed with only a staff. And he went up against a great Egyptian, the Bible says, who had a spear and with just a staff in Benaiah's hand. He plucks the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and kills him with his own spear. We read about Elhanan who slew the giant, the, the brother of the giant Goliath and his greatness. Their names all have God tied into it, the meaning of their names. Benayim simply means, means built up by Jehovah. Eleazar, God has helped. Eliam, God's people. Elhanan, whom God has graciously bestowed. Asahel, made by God. Eliphelet, God, his deliverance. And Uriah meant the Lord is my light. This list of great men is quite a stout list of greatness. One man killing 800 in battle, hand stuck to the sword. One man against an entire troop and winning. Killing lions in pits on snowy days. Killing giants. Their names all referencing God moments or a God difference in their life. These seem to be the epitome of of greatness. There are two approaches I could take today on Father's Day, and yes, I am preaching to the men of Phoenix Revival Center, but I'm preaching to every individual because the principles apply to all of us. There's two approaches I could take here today. I could, I could really increase my poll numbers by calling every one of the men in this church and likening them to one of David's mighty men. The second approach that I could take that most pulpits in America today are taking is reaming every man for not being one of these great men. But I, when I'm preaching to you, I am preaching to me as well. And personally, I have a hard time identifying with this group of great men in David's Hall of Fame. I have never fought with a sword and I've shot a gun, but I've never fought with a gun. I have never been in battle one time as far as a physical battle. The closest I've ever encountered a lion is at a zoo with a major barrier between us. I have never killed a giant, although I have killed rats and spiders. And my family thinks I'm a hero for that. Especially Shay. If y'all find Shay a girlfriend that can kill spiders and rats, he's getting married quick. I just tell you that right there. I have never broke through a troop to get a particular brand of bottled water for my dad or for my pastor. With all due respect, I cannot liken myself or this tremendous group of men that I've been called to pastor to David's mighty men. However, on the other hand, I refuse to ring myself or this great body of men in this church for not measuring up to the list of David's mighty men. 
while we may not have killed a lion or defeated a troop of 800 all by ourselves, this church is blessed by faithful hard-working, God-fearing, prayerful men. I think we ought to give God a hand clap of praise for the men of God in this church. I'll tell you what is a pastor's dream come true. Godly men, faithful men, God-fearing men, men like PRC. God, I thank you for the men in this church. So I'm not here to call you one of David's mighty men. And I'm not here to beat you up for not being one of them either. My point today is I want to look at the backstory. So look at your neighbor say the backstory. I want to look at the backstory of David's mighty men. And I want to gain perspective. And I want to glean from them for my own life. For a good man is always looking for ways to better himself. I refuse to remain average. Surely when we look at this group of great men and the great deeds, uh, you would say, well, obviously they had to have been born in greatness. They had to have been sent to the best schools in the land. Uh, They had a bright beginning, no bumps in their life. Uh, They had top-notch schooling and training. But this is not the case for most, if not all of them. Most, if not all, of these mighty men of David joined him when he was running for his life hiding in caves from King Saul. When David was on the run and things weren't great in his life like I referenced when we were singing, God sent David a group of men to be with him during this time. Let me pause from the main thought and just throw out because I feel prompted by the Holy Ghost right now. When you're facing hell, God's going to send people into your life to walk through hell with you. And if you're going through hell, join up with them and just keep going to the other side until you see a little bit of hell. Oh, you ought to go ahead and receive that. You're not fighting this by yourself. You got God has placed a group, PRC family around you. Let's do it together. For Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, describes the group that God put around David. I'm sure David probably scratched his head a little bit. David therefore departed thence, escaped to the cave of Dulam. When his brother and all his father's house heard it, they went down to thither to it. Remember, his family was jealous of him. Verse number two, and everyone that was in distress, everyone in debt, and everyone that was discontented uh, gathered themselves to him, and he became a captain over there, over them, and there were about 400 men. And it was from this group of 400, history tells us, that David's mighty men came from. Not exactly the top 400 you would choose. When you're hiding in a cave, you don't want people with issues. You want people to help you get out of your issues. But God sent David people with issues in his life. They were in distress. That means they were in confinement, disability, anguish. They were in debt in those days. If you could not pay your debt, you had one option. You became a slave to the person you owed the money to. They were discontented. That means they were bitter. They were angry. They were chafed. Eugene Patterson translated it like this. All who were down on their luck came around, uh, losers and vagrants and misfits uh, of all sorts. David was surrounded by 400 men uh, that were disabled, uh, broke, in debt, ready to become slaves. uh, And to top it off, they were bitter, angry, and chafed. And now they're going to live together in a cave. You thought it was bad in the dorms, guys. Imagine being in a cave with 400 bitter rejects. With issues in their life. It sounds like a recipe for a huge brawl to me. Not exactly what you would call greatness. But from this group, the misfits, the ones that didn't, their life didn't turn out the way they thought it should. The ones that were at this point in life said, I never meant for it to be this way. The 
ones that were uh, like uh, one more payment away from being a slave for the rest of their life. Uh, the ones filled with bitterness that was just bored and eaten inside of them. Uh, the ones with all these issues uh, from this group. Uh, from this group uh, came a man that slew 800 with a spear. Uh, from this group, uh, of, you're not hearing this pastor right now. From this group of rejects and misfits uh, came Benaiah who hops into a pit uh, on a snowy day uh, and fights a lion uh, and comes out victorious. Uh, from this group of men uh, who were selfish uh, and self-centered uh, and thought only of themselves. Uh, that's why they were in debt. Uh, that's why they were bitter. Uh, that's why they were disabled. Uh, came three mighty men uh, that said the king uh, wants a drink of water uh, from the well of Bethlehem. Uh, I'm laying my comfort aside. Uh, I'm laying my preferences aside uh, and I will endanger my life uh, to honor the man of God. Uh, I'm here to tell you from a group of 400 men uh, that did not have their junk together uh, and they were messed up uh, came David's mighty men. What a transformation. Transformation begs the question, how in the world could that be? You've seen it over and over. People get themselves in a mess. Seems like they remain in a mess. You hear of the lottery winners that they win the mega jackpot. of millions are in their hand. They say, first thing I want to do is pay off all my debt. They pay their debt off, and then within five to ten years, they're back in debt the same way as before. How do you let go of the bitterness? How do you let go of the self-centeredness? How do you let go of the disabilities? How could that happen? How do you go from distressed, being in debt and discontent to one of David's mighty men? The only answer I can come up with uh, is the title of my message today. Uh, they were changed by the influence uh, of the king. I'll say it again. Uh, their transformation came uh, by the influence uh, of uh, the king. Uh, they were around David and hiding in a cave. Uh, they watched him uh, when he could have taken Saul's life. Uh, but he had some God-fearing uh, principles in his life. Uh, he said, I will not touch God's anointed. Uh, I will not go down that path. Uh, they watched him walk carefully before the Lord. Uh, and they said, hey, uh, there's something different. Uh, and he began to pattern a godly life to them. Uh, and then as he ruled as king, uh, his influence shaped and molded them uh, to their place of greatness. A ragtag group of outcasts that were in anguish, disabled, and great debt and filled with bitterness became David's mighty men that we preach about was because of the influence of a king. If we were honest today, we'd probably identify much easier with this group in the cave than we do with the list of mighty men. I'm not just talking to our men today. I'm talking to every individual in this house. The reason I say it's easier for us to identify with the men in the cave, the rejects, than it is the mighty men, is because we tend, we tend and we are quick to point at our inabilities, our shortcomings, our faults, and our failures. Well, you should do this. Well, I could, but I, I, I just I have this and this and this. We are so too quick to point out that. We tend to think less of ourselves uh, than who we really are. And then we begin to view ourselves in the grasshopper syndrome. And what I mean by that is referenced in the Old Testament uh, when the children of God said, uh, I see the enemy. We, uh, the, yes, it's a promised land. We could go in, uh, but the, the, the land is filled with giants, and we are grasshoppers in their sight. Uh, they never said that uh, about the children of God. The children of God said that about themselves uh, until they convinced themselves uh, we're grasshoppers and they're giants. Uh, we will never be able to possess it. But if God said we can, we can. But they held on to the grasshopper syndrome so long uh, until it convinced them beyond the promises of God. Uh, their imagination uh, was greater than the power of God. And as men and individuals living in this day, uh, we begin to throw out our shortcomings uh, and our faults uh, until we see there's ourselves as grasshoppers. 
And while there may be some truth to our self-evaluation, and we may not be all that we should be, I refuse to remain in a condition of average or less than average. I have hope in my soul today. I can get around the King of Kings. I will seek out the influence of the king. I will be around him. I can never be the dad I need to be. I can never be the husband I need to be on my own. I can never be the pastor I ought to be. But if I can get around the king, if I can be influenced by the king... If I can get influenced by the king, I want to become a better father. I want to become a better husband. I will become a better pastor. It's not going to come from a book. It's going to come from the influence of the king. I will seek out his influence. I will be around him. I will allow his voice to shape my life. This word right here will guide me as I lead my family. Not pop psychology, not pop culture, but this word will guide me as I lead my family. I will become all that the king wants me to become. I must, I must have the influence of the king in my life. You know what my prayer has been lately? My prayer has been lately, God, let you be formed in me. Much younger man, when I was a much younger man, I may have been, God, help me to preach this meeting, help me to do that, or preach the greatest, but now I realize that's, that's fluff. My, my prayer is God. Let your nature be formed in me. You know, that's a prayer of it saying, God, I need your influence. Man, let's just face it. We're facing stuff we have not faced before. The world is going crazy. It's going to hell in a handbasket. Crazy thoughts, crazy processes. And if I, if I just get in cruise control mode, I'm going to be influenced by everything out there. I've got to have the influence of the king in my life. All let's lift our hands and talk to God right now. This is raw, it's blunt, but I believe it's from heaven today. I've got to have the influence of the king in my life. The second question we must ask today, first of all, we asked, how did they go from the cave to being mighty men? It's the influence of the king. The second question we must ask is, how is one influenced? How can I be influenced by the king? It's not enough to say I want to be. How can I be? First of all, if you're going to be influenced by someone, you've got to be around that person. This is elementary, but it's going to help somebody today. You've got to be around that person. There are some things that are taught, and there are some things that are caught. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, the people noticed Peter and John. They said, wow. They have been with Jesus. There was something going on in their life that said, that looks just the way Jesus would have done it. It sounds just like Jesus would have said it. It responded just like Jesus. I'm here to tell you, you want the influence of the king. You need to get around the king of kings. You don't need to just check in with him on Sunday or on Christmas or on Easter and pray only on Sunday and Wednesday, but on a daily basis. If you want the influence in your life, you got to be around him on a regular basis. Hey dad the best thing you can do for your family is not take them to Disney World. The best thing you can do is take them to the house of God and engage in the presence of the Lord and get engulfed in the presence of the Lord. But if you really want the influence of the king, as good as it is in church, you ought to take him into the presence of the Lord in your living room. You ought to take him into the presence of the Lord in their bedroom, praying over their home, praying over their bedroom. You want the influence of the king. It's not a Sunday connection. you got to be around him. 
Second way one is influenced, you must communicate with the king. I'll never forget in Bible school, I was being taught a whole lot of stuff. And a lot of it I have forgotten, especially eschatology, which is prophecy, which was two hours of prophecy back to back on the same day. And the teacher had a monotone voice. And he loved eschatology so much, he thought all of us Bible college students were honest. It's confession time right now, okay? He thought we would love it as much as he did. So if you checked in for the first class and signed your name, he assumed you were going to be there for the second one. But we felt the Lord, uh, no, it wasn't Lord. We felt our flesh compel us to the donut shop for the second hour. There was a lot taught to me in Bible school. There was a lot more communicated to me on my break time when I'd step into my grandfather's office who was on staff there. And I would sit across the desk from that man of God. He began to share life experiences with me. Uh, I'm here to tell you, if you want a communication with the king, uh, it's not just going to be being around him. Uh, you're going to have to pray. You want a strong dad? You better be a praying dad. You want the influence of the king in your house? You better be praying and talking to God. But let me take it a little farther. Prayer is not one way where you talk to him and give him your cosmic wish list. At some point you need to close your mouth and open your heart and open your ears and let God start talking to you about what he wants to do with you and say, it's not my will but a sign be done. What do you want me to do? It's communication with the king where I talk to him and then I zip my lip and he talks to me. I'm talking about being influenced by the king. Third way one is influenced. Read his word. It's elementary, but it works. I feel like I'm preaching to people that are either bored with this or say it doesn't work, but I'm here to tell you it works, it works, it works. My God, what would happen in our homes and in our families if you would put Facebook and Instagram down and pick up the Word of God as much as you do your social media. I just heard recent stats that the average young person in America, teenager, spends seven, was it seven hours a day, I think, on social media. The average adult, five hours a day. You got time to pray. You got time to read your Bible. It's called a priority. Do you want the influence of the king or do you want the influence of everybody's false world they're portraying? I'm here to tell you, let's pick up the word of God. You said you come into service and say, I just need a word from God. Maybe he had a bunch of words for you this week. You just didn't pick up the word and read it. You want his influence. You must find out what he thinks. He has given us his word to influence us, to mold us, and to shape us. God, I want your thoughts in my mind. If I want his thoughts, I got to open up the word of God and put it into me. Thy word, O oh God, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know what that is? That is the word of God saying, I will influence the steps you should take, the decisions you should make, and how you ought to guide your family. I know it's a crazy world, but I've got a lamp. I've got a light. I've got the influence of the king. We can navigate our way all the way to heaven. The fourth way I'm influenced is by our environment. I was at a meeting a while back. It's been a few years now. They had about three young men preaching. Some of it was good and some of it was like, oh, Lord, help them. I appreciate their effort. And then as I looked at them more and looked at the churches they came from, I recognized they were preaching like the environment they came out of. Your environment is so extremely powerful. You become what you are around. It's a powerful force. And if you want to be influenced by the king, you need to be in his presence at home and in church. Most of us today cannot identify with either end of the spectrum. I don't think I have a bunch of men full of bitterness here. Thank God. We got good men in this church. We got hard-working men, faithful men. But if we're real honest, we say, I don't know if I'm that, I'm not, I'm not Maddie man. Killing a rat in the bathroom underneath the trash can is one thing, but killing a lion in a pit on a snowy day, I don't think so. 
or somewhere in between. But if the influence of the king changed men that were outcast to become mighty men, what can King Jesus do influencing us who may find themselves somewhere in the middle of those spectrums? Men of PRC, I've come to tell you, Sister Cleveland, please come. You can become greater than you realize. I've come to tell you, you're exactly what your family needs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess a little bit right now. I've come to tell some wives, your husband is exactly what your family needs. There's not a be better option out there. The grass may look greener on the other side. There's probably more mess fertilizing that grass. Your husband is exactly what you need in your family and in your home. Start investing in it. I'm here to tell you. You can, you can go from where you're at at this point of life. You're greater than you realize that you are. You can get underneath the influence of the king. And oh, what a transformation that can occur. What a transformation that can occur. I'm not preaching to bitter men in a cave today. But I recognize I'm not preaching to the mighty men of David either, including myself. We're somewhere there in the middle. We're on our journey. But I'm here to encourage you. Let's submit to the influence of Jesus Christ and allow it to shape you. Would you stand with me and lift your hands all over this house right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you talk to the Lord all over this house right now? We want to do that. I'm going to ask our men to lift your voice like the leaders in the home. Even if you're not a father, God has ordained you as a leader. I'm asking you to lift your voice and talk to heaven right now. I love Boko. I want to ask the men of this church, would you just come stand in this front area right here? Would you just come stand quickly, men of this church, men in attendance today, would you come stand? Come stand right here in this center area, please. Thank God for these men. I thank God for these men. Does this pastor's heart so good when worship is going? I don't see men sitting there, but men are leading in worship. Thank God for faithful men of God. Thank God for faithful men of God that really do want the king's influence on their life. You have influence, men. You are the leaders of this church and of your homes and of your families. I'm going to ask you to lift your hands towards heaven and with your voices lifted high, begin to call out on the name of the Lord all over this house. Ladies, just wait, just wait, ladies. Let these men lift their voice. Now, ladies, would you lift your voice and join in and pray with these men right now? Uh, Start crying out, I want the influence of the king on my life. I've got to have in this world and this day I'm living in. It's crazy. It's out of control. But if I can be influenced by the king, I submit my life to him. I submit my will to him. I will not be shaped by this world and its thoughts. I will be shaped by King Jesus. I want him. I want them to start singing, we want you more and more. Uh, if I can get that in your bosom, man, uh, I don't need more of this world's understanding. I need the influence of the king. Uh, we want you more and more. Would you let that be your heart cry? Uh, someone's going to go from a cave today uh, to the hall of greatness and fatherhood. Ladies, would you come join around? Let's let the presence of God influence all of us today. Men, find your wives at these altars and begin to pray right now.
lift your hands and love the Lord all over this house right now. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I think the most important thing we can do in this altar right now is not respond to the emotion of the message. To make up in our minds that we are going to surrender to Him completely. You want influence in your life, you must submit to that influence. And so would you surrender your life to His influence right now and say, God, once again I'm placing myself in submission to Your will and to Your way. Would you lift your hands and do that right now? It's not my will, but thine be done. I submit to your influence on a daily basis in my life. I need your presence to guide me as I lead my family in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. It was not just David that influenced a group of men, but in the New Testament, you find Jesus hand-picking 12 disciples. So they were pretty saintly. No, not really. One was a zealot that could tear up more than you could put together. Others were hated by their own people. James and John, their nickname Sons of Thunder, did not come from their peers. It came from Jesus. But that group of 12 men, the course of three and a half years, were so influenced by him that it was them who turned the world upside down. I'm here to tell you the influence of the king can make all the difference in the world. Thank God for the wonderful men of this church. Thank God you're here because you've had some influence in your life. But on a daily basis, let's surrender to his influence over and over until God takes us to a mark of greatness, not for our glory, but for his glory in the name of Jesus. Would you raise your hands and thank God for the men of this church right now. There is strength in this body of men. God, I thank you for the men of this church. I pray a special blessing upon them. Would you guide them as they guide their families and their homes in the way of God? Would you let your influence be upon them in the name of Jesus? We give you praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I pray you have a blessed day today. I love and appreciate, honor every one of you. As you exit for our dads, there are some donuts out there. Please help yourself to one of those compliments of this church through my wife's handiwork. There's also a photo booth. Thank you, Sister Kylie, wherever you are. I almost didn't make it to my office with all the dad jokes listed on there. I love it. I absolutely love it. Stop and get a picture. Post it to our Facebook page. God bless you in Jesus' name. We'll see you in the house of the Lord on Wednesday night.